Hello, everyone. My name is Ann Laver, and I am assistant professor in the Centner School of Music and university organist at Syracuse University. I'm here with my colleague, Natalie Draper, assistant professor of music composition and theory at Syracuse. And we'd both like to welcome you to our web series, Composing for the Organ, Composer Interview Project. This web series is part of a larger project entitled Composing for the Organ. We'll be offering a webinar and virtual concert on Saturday, September 12th at 2020, uh, Saturday, September 12th, 2020, which will be hosted by Syracuse University. Our main goal with this project is to provide educational opportunities to engage with contemporary organ music. The organ, as we know, can be an intimidating instrument for those with no background. And part of what we're doing is trying to demystify the organ, not only by presenting new repertoire in the September 12th events, but by highlighting discussions with composers about how they approach writing for the instrument. So today in our first interview, we will be talking with Carson Kuhlman, and I'd like to welcome him now to the meeting room. Hi, Carson. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. So just a little intro to Carson's work. Uh, composer Carson Kuhlman has had a large catalog of works in many forms, from solo instrumental pieces to operas, and from orchestral works to hymn tunes. His music has been performed in venues that range from the stage of Carnegie Hall to the basket of a hot air balloon. Carson's music appears on over 40 recordings, and his primary composition studies were with Bernard Rands, Judith Weir, Alan Fletcher, and James Willey. As an active concert organist, Kuhlman specializes in the performance of contemporary music and over 300 new compositions by more than 100 international composers have been written for him. So we'd like to begin this interview, Carson, with uh, just hearing a little bit about what first led you to write organ music. We're assuming that you began playing the organ before you began writing, but tell us a little bit more about how that all started for you. Um, my first organ pieces actually pre do predate my studying the organ. I, I studied the piano from a young age, like, like most people that end up playing the organ do. And I started composing a few years before I started playing the organ. Uh, and so I wrote, I wrote pieces for many instruments at that point that I didn't play. Um, and the organ was one of them. Though certainly during that time, there was sort of increasing interest for me in the organ as a performance instrument. And then eventually it ended up becoming what I, that ended up becoming my sort of whole performance life. I, I moved on from the piano. So what drew you to the organ in the first place as a pianist? Um, I was exposed to it mostly through church, as many people are, the place where you're going to hear it regularly. Um, and I, I don't even remember what specific reasons there were. I, I enjoyed its sounds. I enjoyed its repertoire. It seemed like uh, an interesting thing to pursue. And at some point, it just sort of took over from continuing on with the piano for me. So may we ask what age you were when you began writing for the organ? I think the first pieces for the organ were written during my first few years of composing. So that was like age 10 or 11. 10 or 11, you got into it early. Yeah. <laughs> and what, could you describe how you felt about writing for the organ? Was it, did it make you uh, anxious, excited? Well, at that point, because it was at the beginning of my composing life in general, it was it was just like everything else. I mean, I didn't know anything about writing for the clarinet or the viola either. So those were sort of new adventures too. And the organ was the organ was just another one of those. So it was a little different than someone who. It's far more typical, I think, that someone comes to writing for the organ later in life after they've already sort of built an established body of of work as a composer. But for me, it was just at the beginning, along with everything else. Great. Um, I just wanted to ask, you know, since you are an organist, um, even though you started composing for the organ before that, but um, how has that experience changed the way you think about writing organ music? 
I think it's it's mostly a matter of familiarity and sort of being deep inside the instrument and um, even more than the instrument, really it's repertoire. My whole life and career has really centered around contemporary music for the organ, not just my own, but that of, of many hundreds of other people as, people as well. <clears throat> and so being part of that, just being part of that environment, it, it's, I'm sure it's affected me in any number of ways I don't even, I don't <laughs> even know. Um, but one, one does become pretty comfortable with the thing one spends most of every day doing. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I just have finished writing a piece for Dr. Labor, and um, it's my first time writing for the organ. So it's been interesting to to get used to that. And uh, sitting at the organ has been so critical for this process, mm -hmm. and really getting to know it. So I can only imagine that having done that and really experimented with different registrations probably helps your imagination a lot when you're sitting down and thinking about a piece. I think so. I think so. It's certainly, it's certainly, I, it is, I, I think it is one of those instruments. Um, I would also put the guitar and the harp in the same category. That are, <laughs> the, the entry barrier is very difficult for a non-player. And I, I have to say, I, I've, as I said, my whole life as a new organ music, um, as a performer, as an editor, as many other things, I've looked at many, many, many thousands of organ scores. And I, I've never seen a score by a non-organist that I wasn't able to tell was by a non-organist. <laughs> that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that the that the music is invalid or has right, no value. Right. That definitely doesn't mean that. But I've never been a, I've never been fooled personally from that. And so I think <laughs> I I have a feeling if I asked a guitarist, they would probably say the same thing. Yeah. Um, I think there are certain instruments that 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 there are certain barriers you that you know you just you come to it with a different perspective and you play it. Yeah, I was talking to a friend about that recently too, that those instruments are the ones that are typically left out of the orchestration books. And that's yeah. a big hurdle, which is an issue. Um, yeah. But I also want to ask you, does improvisation play a role um, in your process? Uh, for me, it does not. I, I do very much improvise as an organist, but for me, it's a, it's a very separate thing from composing. For me, they live in very different places mentally. Uh, composing requires sort of refinement and editing and nitpicking, and it's not in real time. And improvisation is basically a sort of highly intelligently controlled bluster, where you're <laughs> sort of in the moment, in the moment doing what you can to make the effect come over, and when it's over, it's over. It's exceptionally ephemeral. And that doesn't mean there aren't overlapping or underlying skills that are the same. If you're, if you are skilled and in counterpoint, say for example, those skills are going to benefit you as both an improviser and a composer. Right. Um, but for me, they are not connected disciplines because for me, they they serve such different aesthetic purposes, and the time scale is, is just so different. Yeah. Um, that I I just I for me I can't connect them. That it's a little unusual. I think most organists who compose to whom you ask that question will say that they start by improvising. Um, for me, that's not the case. And I think that it may, in my case, simply be because I am a composer first and an organist second. Sure. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So what's your process like, Carson? Can you tell us a little bit about when you get a new piece uh, or, you know, you've been asked to write a piece or you know you need to write a piece for next week's uh, service? What, how do you begin? Um, it begins with hopefully a lot of mental work um, that sometimes can take a long time or not. It sort of depends on how uh, how much one is given for that. Many projects, there is a fairly long lead time, a year or more or, or half a year or so. And so sort of at that initial agreement stage, I may have some sort of vague thoughts in mind that I then sort of keep coming back to it over, over the time that follows. Um, and if something has to be done quickly, it, that doesn't necessarily change. You're just sort of forced to make decisions a lot faster. Um, or perhaps even draw on a concept that you've thought of, but just sort of put aside for some reason um, or, or some idea. Um, and so for me, once I have, once I crack that nut of what the idea of the piece is, the, for me at least, the rest of it tends to come together very, very quickly. Um, it can just sometimes be an extremely long process to get that I, initial idea right. Oh, some, sometimes that happens fast, sometimes it does not. Um, though then after that, for me at least, it's, it's, uh, 
it tends to move along. It's it's work, but it but it it tends to be smooth work. So then you're drawing on sort of technique and ex experience and and all of that to put it together. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Um, let's shift back to speaking about the organ in particular, and uh, mm -hmm. we're curious to hear from you what you find especially gratifying about writing for the organ. You've written many organ pieces. Um, what do you enjoy about this particular instrument and the challenges it brings? I think like, like many composers, I write a lot, largely what I'm asked to write. And I've been asked to write a fair amount of organ music, which may or may not have anything to do with my activity in the world of organs and organs, organists and such. It, I, likely does. But um, um, I think what's gratifying to me is not even so much about the instrument itself, um, above and beyond anything, any other instrument or any other combination, but just the fact that there, there are a lot of opportunities for the use of organ repertoire. Um, the fact that nearly all organists work in church context means that there is a much more regular performing life that goes on and a much more variety. You know, you can't play the same piece week after week. That's very different than, say, a concert pianist preparing, you know, for six months their recitals, their like single program that they're going to take around and tour. And, you know, and it's not just church services, many, many places, especially more in Europe than here. But even some here, there are weekly, in some cases, some places, daily organ recital series, you know, particularly throughout Germany. It's just sort of amazing, that kind of thing. And if you're the organist at that place and you're playing a lot of those recitals yourself, you're not, you can't repeat the same thing all the time. So I think there's a, there's a certain thing that's baked into the, the world of organists that makes them more open to a wide ranging amount of repertoire. And there are more slots there. Um, for that reason. So I think from a composer's perspective that that has appeal in the sense that most people who write music um, write it so that it will be performed. So on the flip side of that, um, what do you find most challenging about writing for the organ? I mean, I know that a lot's going to come easily because you have such a long history of playing and mm -hmm. writing for it, but since you did start out as a pianist mm -hmm. and probably have, you know, you've written for many other groups as well. So what yeah. do you find challenging? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I can speak more generally to this large, not even so much from my own perspective, but I've worked with a lot of composers writing for the organ for the first time um, in different ways. So it's sort of, I've, I've sort of seen the different ways that people find things challenging. I think one is what I alluded to before, which is just that it is an instrument that has a lot of sort of technical understanding issues that are not as obvious or as straightforward as certain other instruments. Um, it's not an instrument who people are going to encounter quite as readily as, say, you would a piano or a violin or such. So, so there's also a sort of exposure gap there. Um, I think another big challenge that's often a big mental hurdle for a composer to get over is the amount of control you need to be willing to see. And um, I mean, I was trained as a composer by fairly modernist minded people. And, you know, the, the sort of mindset you get in is a, is, a, is, a, is a very controlling one. You specify everything. You don't leave any note without an articulation or dynamic. At the end of a hairpin, you put exactly where you want that. You know, you don't leave those details to chance. You, you, you figure out your bowing, you figure out your heart pedaling, you do all of that, whether or not it goes in the score. Um, and, that kind of approach I find dramatically uh, unhelpful when, when, when people approach writing for the organ. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a matter of, you need to be specific, but you need to be absolutely no more specific than you absolutely need <laughs> um, to convey the ideas at hand. And that is the, the most common problem and the most common sort of disastrous mess that you deal with when you get scores from non-organists. Um, and so I think there are some people who can never make that mental leap. And I, I get it, I get it because I came out of that, you know, I came from that sort of mindset compositionally from training. So it's a, it's a sort of thing you have to get over. And I think if you can't, you probably shouldn't, you should just move on and write for other things. Um, yeah. So I think, I think that, that definitely proves a challenge to people. Even people that are willing to, you still, you still have to sort of step outside yourself and put a lot of trust in your, uh, in your performer. Yeah. So maybe just for our, our audience here, can you 
tell why you need to relinquish some of that control with the organ specifically? Well, I, it's, it's the, the vast difference between instruments is the, is the underlying reason for that. And not just the instruments themselves, the rooms in which they sit, you know, and everything about them, the areas in which they were built, the what particular stops they may have, what size they are. The, the tremendous variation of all those factors means that, that you're, you, need to, you need to rely to a large degree on the experience of a capable person who's playing it to make many of those decisions in an effective way. Um, and there's a plenty of, I mean, I could talk about plenty of technical details and how that tends to manifest itself in, in what I feel unhelpful ways for people. But, but I think it's, it's um, you, you're, you need to, you need to, um, you need to be understanding that in the end, you're producing a score that you, that may sound really radically differently than, than how it sounded the first time you heard it or the second time you heard it. And you need to be able to live with the fact that you can't have an exact sound image in your head for how that's going to be. And that, that is very hard for some people. You know, if I write a piece for string quartet, I can have in my head a very specific sound image for what it's like. And I can be sort of disappointed or not as to the realization of it relative to that. But if you go into organ music with that approach, you're, you'll never be happy. And I think that for, for certain composers, particularly those who work in kind of noise music kind of genres and things and are obsessed more with timbre than say harmony or any other sort of more traditional parameters. For those for whom that is their primary concern, I, I'm not sure you can ever satisfyingly write organ music. I think you, you could write a piece that maybe has an okay performance on one organ with one person at one time. Um, personally, that has no interest to me because if a piece can't have at least the potential for some life, I don't see the point of spending the time. But I think there are, there are many composers whose, whose artistic language falls <clears throat> in that direction that's far more, that prioritizes the specificity of timbral things far above anything else. And I think if that's where you're coming from, you're kind of wasting your time with the organ. Would you say that that was a learning process for you? So when you first for started- For me personally, writing? no, yeah. no, okay. not at all. Be because, because um, again, the, the or, sort of the organ in its strengths and weaknesses were a part of my world from, from early on. So, you know, I, to me, complaining about that makes no more sense than complaining that, you know, a clarinet can't play a note that a contrabassoon can. Like, the instrument doesn't do that. So, like, why would I, why would I complain about that? <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but are there other aspects of your approach to the organ um, or your style related to the organ that you've noticed have changed over time as your perspective has maybe changed? I'm not sure specifically. I mean, I, I hope like anything, I get better and better at doing it with more, pra you know, in, but that would be true of writing anything in any genre. So um, I've, I, I'm sure my work and exposure to many excellent organists um, and, and such have had a sort of impact. I'm not sure that I could say like there's a specific point where the, this thing sort of clicked or changed in a different way. Um, but it would be hard to imagine it not having having something even if I couldn't quantify it. So I thought I'd ask sort of, you know, specifically um, if there are any compositional techniques or procedures that you've found that have been especially suited to the organ. Um, I think that you know that any sort of detailed example would be really interesting for our audience. Sure. Um, I mean, like any instrument, you want to sort of approach it with its essential character. I think the organ, the organ tricks people because it has a keyboard, <laughs> um, when in reality, writing for it has really nothing to do with, say, writing for the piano. And you'd be, you'd be better off, frankly, if you weren't, if you didn't know that much about writing for the piano, in my opinion, um, other than maybe the sort of very basics of, of how the fingers press the keys. Um, I, think that's, I think that's what sends, that's what sends many composers down the wrong path to start with, um, because odds are they have at least some facility with the piano. Um, when in reality, um, thinking of it more like a string orchestra or a wind ensemble or things can sometimes be more helpful when you're thinking about the, not so much the technical realization of it, because obviously it has to fall under hands and feet, but in terms of the kind of music that, um, that it can project, project the best. 
So I think some of that, some of that is just sort of not being fooled by the, the keyboard aspect of it. Um, uh, and I think, I think another thing that tends to get people off on the wrong track early on is issues of, of dynamic change. Um, I think one does oneself a disservice if not starting from the sort of understanding that it is an instrument of sort of terraces and on and off kind of dynamic sounds and changes. And I think, I think when one doesn't have that as the underlying core, you're sort of working against the most idiomatic foundation of the instrument. And obviously in 20th century organ building and things, there's been many efforts to sort of mitigate that by making the instrument ridiculously large, by making many stops that come on and off without announcing themselves, by enclosing things within boxes, or in some cases, boxes within boxes, um, to, to, open, to open and close the, the swell trays and louvers. But all of those are basically covering up for the, what the instrument fundamentally is, which is a sort of on and off machine, both in terms of the stops and in terms of the key. And so I think, I think that's a piece of understanding that needs to be baked into it from a start because you don't always have at your disposal an instrument like, you know, like a Woolsey Hall, Yale, or a, or a Wanamaker Grand Court thing where instruments that are designed to sort of produce a wide gradation of sort of orchestral effects. Um, and if your music for the organ is going to rely on those sounds, you are going to be mostly getting some pretty disappointing realizations on the sort of medium organs that are in the rest of the world. And I think that's something that organists deal with in general is sort of figuring out what the appropriate repertoire is for, for an instrument and, and whatnot. And, and, you know, sort of you learn how to cludge things as you have to, but sort of fundamentally, fundamentally there are excellent instruments that are excellent at particular things that don't do other things. Your instrument in the, Crowd's auditorium there is a perfectly good example. That's a very fine instrument of a important builder representing a particular style and, and a particular time. But personally, I sure don't want to hear um, orchestral style organ music played on that organ. That is for sure. Um, but that doesn't take away from the excellent things that it can do. Do you have um, a piece that you feel, so I mean, I'm, I'm sure that all of your pieces, you've uh, they are going to be really tailored pretty well to the organ because of your background. But is there one that stands out where you're just like, oh, this really took such good advantage of the different registrations and the different techniques that I can do on the organ? Well, I, I, I try to keep the pieces as general as possible and because I want people to be able to take them and play them on different instruments and in different places. Um, so I, my philosophy of registration and what I strongly encourage other people to do is to specify only the absolute minimum things that you need to specify in registration. Sometimes that might be something very specific, often it is not. And, and that is something that I, I feel is best left up to the thing because you, you all the time, you, I mean, I, as someone who is constantly receiving new pieces um, by other people, you're, you are constantly receiving scores and you look at them and what it is filled with is it's filled with specific stop names from the specific organ on which the thing was first premiered. And that, that doesn't tell me useful information. Like, yes, it tells me what knobs you pulled out and because I might know that organ or I might know that style or whatever, I might be able to make it. But it doesn't tell me how important any of those choices are. You may have just written down the sounds that sounded okay that first time or that a particular timbre may be a sort of absolute deal breaker on something, in which case I'd be like, well, sorry, I'm not going to play this because I don't, I can't make that timbre happen here. And so that's what I feel. I feel the, the over specificity is it's giving too much information, but it's not useful information because it doesn't actually tell me what are the essential elements of this from a compositional standpoint. Um, and so that is why I strongly encourage composers to use as little information as possible about registration. That doesn't preclude understanding about what's possible in terms of registration and organ colors. That is useful because then that helps you avoid making stupid mistakes, like say <laughs> specifying a single timbre and then demanding that that timbre doesn't change from three Ps up to four Fs, which is something that's not possible on the organ. You can't do that. You can't change volume to certain degrees without, without register changes also coming into the mix. And for some people, the way some people hear that is very disconcerting, but you sort of, you have to accept that fundamentally as a part of how the instrument works. So understanding all that is I think very significant because it, it sort of will make you 
think about the kind of music that you can best project. But I find going and writing in very specific stop names, I find that tremendously unhelpful. And I think it does a piece, a huge disservice when you're thinking about any future life for it. So within the umbrella of, um, of not doing that, you know, of making sure that your pieces are something that could translate very well to other organs, are there techniques that you have found that you think are particularly, that come off particularly well on multiple organs um, and really make the instrument shine? I mean, I think, I think a certain degree of dynamic specificity is useful. Again, as I said, bearing in mind the idea that sort of gradual dynamic changes, while possible, are not actually the fundamental core of what the organ is or does. Um, so sort of beware of using them or be aware of the kind of bumpiness or lack of bumpiness that can happen. Um, unless the organ is very large, an enormous crescendo is not going to be completely smooth the way it is in an orchestra or like a clarinet, you know, pick an instrument that has an incredibly huge dynamic range. I think, I think sometimes expressive um, or poetic or, or just descriptive terms can sometimes be very useful. You know, if you want a particular passage to have a sound, a sort of eerie or, or unusual timbre, something like that is actually far more useful than saying, well, at the first performance, the organist chose these four stops and that, because that that may not mean anything and that may not you're not you know you know I think also um, understanding some degree of what's possible with different sounds at the same time is useful not necessarily in the same case of, of specifying exactly but for example things like a solo and accompaniment kind of texture that can be very useful to specify but you don't have to specify what that is you could say quiet solo quiet accompaniment let the organist choose what that, what that best sound is going to be on the instrument at hand, rather than writing down the name of what you saw there. So I think, I think all of that is sort of, it's sort of conveying, it's conveying your musical ideas in, in the most general terms, so that then a skilled organist can find a way to make that particular piece sound the very best it can on the, the organ that, that he or she is playing. This is great, Carson. You've given us lots of pearls of wisdom. Um, I wonder if there are any other pieces of advice you might offer to uh, composers out there that want to try writing for the organ but haven't had the chance yet. Um, are, there, are there other things you might want to tell them uh, in addition to what you've already said about dynamics and, and letting go of some control and those types of things? I mean, I think, I think particularly in one's first pieces, uh, a, a good relationship with the performer is, is likely to be essential to its success. Um, and ideally working with a performer who's willing to sort of go along with you on the journey as you invariably mess up a lot along the way, that's gonna happen. Um, and, and I think the vast majority of organists, certainly those that are willing to program new music are willing to go along on that journey because there's sort of no other way to get to the, to get to the to get to a satisfying result. Um, and I think that understanding that, I think there's sometimes a frustration because it sort of feels like, it's like, well, I know how to write music and, and you know, and, it's, and it's, it's like writing for the guitar for the first time. You're like, absolutely none of this makes sense. None of these chords make sense, how they fit under the fingers and how the string, and why does the instrument make so much noise instead of pitch? And sort of all, all those things that just feel like this is completely foreign. And, and I think just to someone looking at the organ, it has sort of that same kind of, there's a certain kind of forbidding aspect to that. And I think the, the collaboration with the performer at the beginning is going to be pretty essential to get you through that. Um, and then, bear, I, as I said, sort of bearing in mind what I think are a lot of those other things. And I think also then, like writing for any instrument, can, trying to connect as much as one can with the instrument's repertoire, you know, of which there is plenty. Uh, organists are very fortunate that basically every significant composer in history wrote something for it. That's an exaggeration, but it's less an exaggeration than it is for, say, the bassoon or something. Um, so that, that means there's a, there's a really wonderful body of work in a very wide variety of, of styles and textures and, and idioms. And particularly since we're at a time right now where there is no common practice style and people's music is all over the map and the expressive things they're exploring. Almost certainly anything you can think of someone's done before in some way. So the repertoire exists there for you to think, to learn from and draw on to make your own, to make your own work out of it. 
Well, this has been really fantastic, Carson. We, we really thank you for taking the time to talk with us. Um, your experience, you have such a um, you know, long experience and wide experience writing for this instrument. So it felt right to ask you to be our first uh, interview. And uh, we really appreciate that you said yes. So thanks a lot oh, for that. Of course. Um, as I mentioned in the opening, Carson has uh, a, been a prolific composer for organ. So if you want to, uh, for the people watching this video, we encourage you to go to Carson's website, which I'm going to attempt to uh, pull up here right now. And show you what that looks like. And uh, we also invite you to join us for our series of webinars and virtual concert on September 12th. It's very easy to register for that. It is free and open to anyone who would like to join us. The webinars will take place from 12 noon on that day all the way until about 5.30. And if you visit our registration page, you can find the full schedule. And then we'll be releasing a virtual concert at 7.30 p.m. that night. So we invite you to join us for that. And we'll be continuing to discuss these topics at that event. Uh, but for now, thanks very much for, for listening and for watching. And thank you again. Carson, for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, Carson.